Um, but what I'll do is um, I'll speak on behalf of uh, some of maybe the uh, Muslim perspective on the environment and uh, and again like how how we try to see things and approach it from a, a faith perspective. Um, so just a quick uh, intro to myself, uh, I guess. Uh, my name is Yusuf Siraj. Uh, you know, I'm a um, Assistant General Secretary for the BC Muslim Association, uh, as well as with um, the Muslim Care Center and, of course, Islam Unraveled. Um, in 2015, scholars, policymakers, and academics from across the Muslim world came together in Turkey to issue what was called the Islamic Declaration on Climate. So we had our faith leaders, our uh, academic experts and scholars actually come together to have a unified declaration from the Muslim and Islamic world, uh, which is that the scientific consensus on climate change uh, is proven, it's real, it's caused by humans, and it has to be addressed at a global uh, to local level. Um, the need to act with clear targets and uh, monitoring, monitoring systems was recommended and the dire consequences of not doing so was highlighted from both a scientific as well as a spiritual perspective. Going right back to the initial communities of Muslims who grew up in a desert environment, right? So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the uh, initial um, believers, they were in what is modern day Saudi Arabia, but back then would have just been Arabia. And in the, the harshness of that climate, the uh, incredible difficulty of life where if everything revolved around water, it revolved around your relationship, your understanding and your humility uh, towards engaging with nature, that entire experience really impacted our, um, our Islamic approach towards uh, ecology, towards the environment, towards ecosystems. There is a saying of the prophet that even if you live by a rushing river, just take what you need. Don't take too much. And, you know, for, for people to really internalize the messages within their faith to become uh, the standard bearers for climate change uh, aversion, we have, to, we have to shift. So who are the people, if not ourselves? That's something that always runs through my mind. When I read the Quran, which is the Muslim holy book, um, and I see God saying to people that we sent you as stewards of the earth. So uh, a slight difference than our Christian uh, brothers and sisters and friends in Islam, the, the concept is uh, khalifa, which means to be a steward, you are responsible, you are entrusted with, it's called an imana, which is something that has a uh, practical as well as spiritual, as well as legal meaning towards it. So every, every community has a trust and that trust is not just something for them to take care of, but to ensure that it is passed on to the next generation. What we're seeing today and what some of our next speakers will touch on is the importance of transitioning from a mindset that someone else will do it, that it is important, but someone else can do it, or that it is important, it is part of our faith, but there's other priorities, that there's other things to do towards, someone, uh, towards a mindset that this is a moral imperative. It is something that if we are not actively taking personal, family, social, community, national and international steps towards addressing, then we will in effect bring upon, um, to, use, to use religious terminology, we would bring upon a judgment upon ourselves by our own actions. So the, uh, the Quran, when talking about moral uh, or social um, mistakes that people do, it's always unrepentant, wanton sinning. When a person goes so much beyond the pale and we start to see greed reach epidemic levels, as faith leaders and as a faith community, we have to be at the forefront of saying, we should not do this, we won't do this. We have to take what we need. We have to be conscious of others' rights. Um, and I would say, first and foremost, the First Nations' rights. Our masjids cannot hold legal prayers on stolen land. So we have done a lot of work uh, through the BCMA, as well as through Islam Unravel, to help to rectify that, um, that historical injustice. Uh, in addition to that, 
um, when I'm talking with a lot of the youth in the Muslim community and our, our next speaker, Maryam, uh, she's going to touch on this in more detail, but I see the demand, the, the yearning from a, a youth as well as a spiritual perspective that we need to connect with our morals, enable, enable our communities to be able at the forefront of making this change, whether it's political, whether it's activist, whether it's education, providing resources or standing uh, in solidarity with our allies that it can no longer just be something that is, is accepted but not acted upon. I would say that the Muslim community of British Columbia is blessed to be here where we can have access to water, where it's not like we're in the Middle East or in the deserts of Arabia, where every single you know, day is a struggle for life and people gain an appreciation. However, I will say that as faith communities, if we are not careful, then that difficult life will be not just some parts of the world, but everywhere. And I don't think as stewards of this earth, as inheritors from previous generations, and as the people responsible to passing on this planet to our future generations, that that would be something that we would want to do. So that's just a, a brief um, perspective uh, to talk practically about what Muslim youth are doing, as well as looking at it from a perspective of active change. Um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, our next speaker, Maryam Noor Vahid, 